As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap During the summer of 1929, teen heiresses and social outcasts Barbara Hutton and Doris Duke desperately want to join Louise Van Allen's debutante ball. They hope to finally win a place in society before their own debuts next year. Now back to As the Money Burns. Score, love all. It's that exciting time of year, tennis in Newport, when a movie star handsome tennis champion and future Wimbledon star comes and challenges our reigning prince's dominance. The originating point of zero in tennis is called love, and that's the game our heiresses are most interested in playing. Ready to keep score over who will win our heiresses' hearts? Section 1 Story Spinning in the bright sky, a tennis ball suspends in air until a wooden racket crashes into it and forces it into play. The pings and jostles of a heated match go on. In the middle of the grass lawn field at Newport's infamous tennis casino, the long-limbed and movie star handsome Francis Xavier Shields, a.k.a. Frank, shows extreme athleticism, already an infamous tennis champion at age 19. His agility, speed, and accuracy only matched by a happy and playful demeanor, both on and off the court. He is the epitome of a gentleman athlete, though he is the poor son of an Irish immigrant family from the Lower East Side. His athletic talent provides Frank entry into and mingling with the upper classes. Dressed in preppy white slacks and sweaters, he might as well be a Ralph Lauren model. The irony? Frank is unaffected by wealth, only wanting to have a good time. All the young females gather and swoon while the males prepare for tough competition. Frank isn't a threat just on the field, but in the hearts of everyone surrounding him. All the heirs and heiresses participate in the tennis matches, singles, doubles, and even mixed doubles. Only two people don't seem to be playing. The illustrious and still injured Russian prince Alexis Divani stays on the sidelines with his arm in a sling from his polo accident. Next to him is devoted companion and superfan, the chubby budding fashionista Barbara Hutton. She is providing him with extra commentary on everyone around them. The prince is none too pleased to be out of the action, especially with so many heiresses floating about and far too many reputable heirs as competition. Later this week, reigning it girl Louise Van Allen will make her debut, so all of Newport is abuzz celebrating and catering to her. Prince Alexis is on high alert not to lose his prize. Frank scrambles across the field and slams the ball for the final match point. The crowd is wild with cheers, including the Van Allen brothers and their cousin, Jakey Astor. None to impress, Prince Alexis mutters, so he swings a stick and hits a ball. Barbara chuckles. Isn't that nearly every sport, including polo? Spotting their animated conversation, Louise congratulates the winner. Ruffled, the prince defensively protests, don't forget, skilled on horseback, far more complicated and dangerous. He motions to his arm. Yes, it's a rather pathetic attempt to bolster his own ego. Frank picks Louise up in a bear hug and swings her around. Her mother, Daisy, flicks her fan to cover her own amusement at Frank's antics. From Frank's embrace, Louise makes eye contact with the prince. Frank runs over to his biggest swooning fan, who is none other than Maude Barger Wallach, 60-year-old former tennis star, his benefactress, and a Newport Society maven. She gushes over him while providing him with lemonade and water as needed. The jolly schoolboy takes her offerings with delight. Over to the side, baby-faced and overly coddled Huntington Hartford is getting the same attention from his mother Henrietta, only he is more embarrassed than grateful. The super tall and awkward Doris Duke stands near him as their mothers want them to play as a mixed doubles pair. She feels like a towering giraffe and Huntington worries her skills are too subpar. Huntington is actually a very good tennis player, but no match for Frank and the other real champs. Doris is saved by none other than the heir to do fortunes and newly divorced Jimmy Cromwell, now mingling amongst the Newport set. Lashy saw him was in Bah Harbor when he crawled into bed naked with her, and she froze. 
Now he acts like nothing happened. Such a relief for Doris as she shyly smiles and fidgets with her racket. Back on the field, Louise warms up for a mixed double set with her oldest brother, James Henry Van Allen, aka Henry, a prominent figure in both U.S. and Newport tennis. Their other brother, William, who goes by Sam, and their cousin, Jakey Astor, join them after their last set of matches. Louise hits the ball with Henry Sam and their bohemian cousin, Ava Astor, Jakey's sister. Louise knocks the ball out of the court, and Frank gracefully hops over the hedge, retrieving it. He interrupts the game to correct Louise's swing. He wraps his arm around her waist as he guides her right hand through the movement. He drips a little sweat on her neck, which tickles, and makes Louise laugh and giggle. Seething from the sidelines, the prince's temper flares. Such a clown. Clown? More like movie star, sighs the dreamily amused Barbara. She hopes that Frank might be a real diversion for Louise's affections. Remember, Barbara wants the prince to reunite with her beautiful friend Sylvia back in France. The prince looks at Barbara, who actually isn't looking at him, but Frank. Henry sees tennis champion William Tilden walking around and breaks away, insisting Frank continues helping Louise warm up. The ball bounces around and Louise takes one hard swing, sinking the ball deep into Frank's chest, for which he acts like a falling wounded soldier. Frank stumbles his way over to the audience, collapsing at Barbara's feet. The crowd and players chuckle in amusement. Frank then pops up, kisses Barbara's hand, and gives her a wink before jotting back to the court. Barbara blushes endlessly. Louise sparks up, realizing Frank might be the distraction she needs with Barbara. For the less humored Prince Alexis Divani, it all plays out like a farce. He jumps up and grabs Barbara's racket, swinging it around with his free arm. Before things get heated, Louise exit and playfully grabs the prince by his good arm and pulls him away. He reluctantly obeys. Louise coos. Come on, Alexis, let's get some refreshments. Secretly, she wants to tell him of her new plan to get rid of Barbara. When they are out of the other sight, Louise gives the prince a quick peck on the cheek. Lost in thought, he does not reciprocate. Louise looks back at the field. Has the game already ended? Before it even really began? Section 2, History and Historiography Tennis is generally a game for the wealthy. The origin is suspected to be in the 12th century northern France with players using their hands. By the 14th century, King Louis X of France became an avid player, even constructing indoor courts, which quickly became en vogue in other European royal courts. After an exhaustive long game in 1316, King Louis X drank wine de coulaw, fell ill shortly thereafter, and died. Some suspect poisoning. His epithet, Le Houtain, translate as the quarrelsome, headstrong, stubborn. The popular accounts of his death make Louis X, the first known tennis player, by name. By 16th century, rackets came into use, along with the term tenis, derived from the French verb tenir, meaning take, receive. The game quickly became popular in France and England. Infamous French queen and famed poisoner Catherine de' Medici would hold games for her young guest, and England's King Henry VIII was also a big fan and player of the game. The modern game of tennis formed in the 19th century with the rules pretty much codified since the 1890s with two exceptions. Between 1908 to 1961, the server has to keep at least one foot on the ground at all times. In 1970s, the tiebreak was officially introduced, which modernized the point challenge system. Overall, tennis is a very democratic game, which anyone can play as long as they have the simplest equipment, a racket and ball. Females too have enjoyed and competed for most of the last century. There are multiple tournaments played worldwide, Wimbledon, French Open, Davis Cup, U.S. Open, to name a few. Tennis was part of the New Olympics until 1924 and reinstated in 1984. In the U.S., amateur versus professional status was always an issue. Lots of top players come from wealthier families, but occasionally a kid from the wrong side of the tracks might make a name. In the U.S., the long-reigning tennis champion, William Big Bill Tilden, was everywhere world's number one player for six years from 1920 to 1925, 14 major singles titles, including 10 Grand Slam events. The first American to win Wimbledon in 1920, he played as an amateur for 20 years from 1911 to 1930, then 15 more as a professional, turning pro in 1930 with another major title win at Wimbledon. 
In 1929, Big Bill became the first player to reach 10 finals at a Grand Slam event, a record not broken until 2017 by Roger Federer for his 11th. Overall, as an amateur, Tilden won 138 out of 192 tournaments, lost 28 finals, and had a 907-62 match record, as in a 93.6% winning streak. Tilden came from a wealthy family in Philadelphia. He survived three older siblings, lost his mother to Bright's disease at 18, and his father at age 22, and another older brother shortly thereafter. In Big Bill's depression, he started playing tennis continuously. He wasn't originally a star, and didn't even make his college team. To play with or be in reference to Big Bill Tilden was quite an honor. Thus, when a young 14-year-old upstart from the Bronx caused a sensation in 1924 by winning nationals in his only third tournament ever, he was dubbed a young Tilden. That upstart was the poor Irish kid, Frankie Shields. When reporters asked his training schedule, instead of the long, detailed list of drills like the wealthier kids, this unpolished kid talked about stringing a net across an empty lot and looking forward to playing basketball. Shields was nicknamed the Jolly Schoolboy. Only three years earlier, he was recruited to play at Columbia Grammar in an attempt to prove the school's sports wins, and he played with Julius Seligson, a longtime friend both on and off the courts. The poor kid from the wrong side of the tracks had a grandfather who ran a string of saloons, a fireman uncle, and a very cranky accountant father. Frank's father was a strict disciplinarian, which meant Frank spent much of his time outside to avoid being home and the lash. He was devoted to his bedridden mother, but lost her before he turned 16. He had a younger brother, too, who died before the age of 10. His three sisters all tried mothering him, somewhat trying to keep him in line and at other times helping him avoid punishment. At school, Frank struggled with dyslexia and would often skip class. He wasn't chastised too often as long as he kept winning. In 1928, he transferred to the boarding school Roxbury outside of New Haven. There he met future opponent and doubles partner Sidney Wood. Frank Shields' early admirer, benefactress, and hostess was Newport socialite Maud Barger Wallach, a female winner of the 1908 U.S. Open at age 38. She would die in 1954. Up until this moment, I have avoided defining Louise's two ever-present brothers. There are just so many heirs and heiresses to cover, I didn't want to muddle up the confusion. They are not central characters, but they appear consistently throughout and link forwards and backwards to the other characters in our story. Born in 1902, James Henry Van Allen II is the oldest child of James Lawrence Van Allen and Marguerite Daisy, great-grandson to the former socialite queen, Caroline Astor, and big brother to Sam and Louise. The siblings will have the somewhat rare situation in which they will almost receive primarily equal inheritance of a substantial nature. Only marriages and one of them's future disinheritance by a particular relative will cause a difference in economics. Second son and middle child, William Lawrence Van Allen, was born in 1907 and actually went by the name of San, which is more than helpful in a story ripe with too many duplicate names and a differentiation from another William Van Allen, the architect of the Chrysler Building, though Sam, too, would become an architect. Sister Louise would be born in 1910. The family, along with their grandfather, seriously, James John Van Allen, lived in Europe during Prohibition, when both brothers matriculated into the British school system, including Eton, Cambridge, and Oxford. It was Sam who befriended a young Prince Alexis Devani while at Eton. The prince would follow him off to Cambridge and live off the generosity of the Van Allens, both in Britain as well as Paris, and occasionally the U.S. At the time of our story, the Van Allen brothers have a house in England with Prince Alexis as their perpetual house guest. As Prince Alexis and his own brothers are devoted to the sport of polo, the Van Allens are prime and influential players in the world of tennis. James Henry Van Allen served as the captain of his Oxford tennis team and played singles at the 1927 French Open, 1922, 1924, and 1925 Wimbledon, and 1931 U.S. Open. Infamous for his one-handed right backhand, he will play against the best players of his days, including and often losing to Tilden. A prominent Newport figure, James was popularly known as Jimmy, but for our story purpose of clarity from other Jimmies and even within his own family, I will refer to him by his middle name, Henry. Sam would grow to have an influence too. He was a founding member, served as the first association president, and on January 30th, 1955, convened the first initial meeting of the United States Court Tennis Association, the governing body regulating, promoting, and preserving the game of tennis. 
1954, James Henry Van Allen helped found the International Tennis Hall of Fame at the Newport Casino, which by then was threatening to be demolished. Instead, it became a museum for players and the history of the game. James Henry Van Allen contributed and developed the Van Allen Streamline Scoring System, VASSS, which included his nine-point sudden death match tiebreak system. He was inspired after a 1954 game, which lasted for four hours, ruined his martini cocktail hour. Thus, he developed the system in 1958, even testing with his other heretics. He was nicknamed the Newport Bolshevik, and after 1965 would tirelessly promote his system. In 1970, the U.S. Open became the first Grand Slam tournament to introduce the tiebreak. The tiebreak also made it possible to now televise matches as prior to that, the players might play endless rounds with no clear victory. The tiebreak was revised over time to 12 points, and it would have an impact on important games involving Arthur Ashe in that first 1970 U.S. Open, and John McEnroe later at Wimbledon, who won the set but still lost the title. Two days after James Henry Van Allen's death in 1991, and after losing to opponent Michael Stitch during a tiebreak, Wimbledon semifinalist Stefan Edinburgh remarked, If he, James, hadn't lived, Michael and I would still be out there playing. Section 3. Contemporary and Personal Relevance My summer long ago spent at Rhode Island's Brown University included my first love. He was a cute foreigner who arrived late in the evening during orientation, and as he sat alone to the side, I went over to invite him to join us, a new crew and tribe only just forming that same day. His mouth was stuffed with a hot dog as he gave me his papers, showing his name and that he was from Istanbul, Turkey. His bright neon attire was inspired by his hero at the time, tennis star Andre Agassi the future husband of actress-model Brooke Shields, the granddaughter of Frank Shields. The extent of my own tennis history back then was playing for one year as a sophomore and making JV tennis, and FYI, the scoring system always baffled me. My sweetheart was happy and kind, and who wrote small bits of poetry, drew sunsets, and as well played the piano and tennis. He would slaughter people on the courts, but was far more playful the one time we played together. Our first dance was to U2's One. A week later, after a performance of Caratop and some bands in Brown Six Pack, under the stars and moonlight, we had our first kiss. My first day trip to Newport, he was my crush. The second day trip, my boyfriend. He said the moment I came up to him, he was hooked. He would trick me with a secret admirer ploy in the computer lab, all of my favorite 80s teen movie, Pretty in Pink. We took the same English class, and after a week of studying Plato's Phaedrus together, it was inevitable, our mutual attraction. We would keep up for a few months into our senior year. We lost touch when my brother died, but reconnected via the internet in college. I saw him once and last in Chicago during my master's program while I was studying Turkish. We have kept in touch off and on since then, only brief updates like happy birthday and to tell him I was doing this podcast partially inspired by our time together. Such was my summer romance long ago. Sweet, cherished memories. If only life could have stayed that sweet. Getting restless yet? Feeling too confined? Well, walking tour and pop-up company New York Adventure Club has gathered its crew and now provides virtual webinars for all sorts of places. If you're enjoying my tales, especially involving the Astors, then check out my own two webinars covering the Waldorf Astoria Hotels on Thursday, November 19th and December 3rd. That's at New York Adventure Club. Website, nyadventureclub.com. Information also available through the news events tab at asthemoneyburns.com. Only $10 live with one week recorded access afterwards. Next, when we return to As The Money Burns, the time is finally here. A debutante is coming out. It's going to be the grand event everyone wants to attend. But first things first, everyone must gather for tea. Until then, As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As the Money Burns via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.